An elderly lady takes on a snake in Australia. A seven-year-old boy saves his mom's life. A woman suffers a horrifying death. And a Christmas tragedy is narrowly avoided. But first, a 10-year-old is the sole survivor of a home invasion. Let's dive in. On September 30th, 2005, 10-year-old Robin Doan woke to hear her mother screaming in fear. Five shots from an AK-47 rang through her family's remote Texas farmhouse, and then there was silence. The elementary student peered through the crack of her bedroom door, watching as a man dressed in black came out of her mother's room and started to walk down the hallway toward her. The young girl hid under the covers of her bed, but shortly after, the stranger entered the child's bedroom pointed his weapon at the bed, and fired. Miraculously, the bullet missed Robin, instead going through her pillow and hitting a plastic drawer. In an act that certainly saved her life, the 10-year-old grunted as if she had been hit and froze. The intruder left and went into the next room where he killed her 14-year-old brother. The killer then took some food from the kitchen and left the Texas home in a truck he had stolen earlier. The young girl didn't move until the sun began to rise. Then, she took the cordless phone from the living room and fled to the driveway where she called 911. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh -huh. there was a shootout in my house. Um, I don't know. She's alive in my house. And I'm scared. Where are you at? Um, 7142 Highway 70. It's about 13.3 miles out from the bowling alley. What's your name? Robin Doan, my parents. Um, uh -huh. Conrad and Brian Conrad. I'm scared of this and I don't know what Robin to do. Robin Doan? Yes, ma'am. strange people around your home or no, anything? No, ma'am. You didn't see a car drive off of any kind? No, ma'am. You just heard the shots fired? Then I heard, I saw the lights on in the kitchen, so I'm assuming they stole some stuff. Okay, okay. <gasps> I can't believe it. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and all I want right now is my blanket and my pillow. First responders arrived at 7.24 a.m. and found Robin sitting on the back of her stepfather's pickup truck. She said she wasn't hurt and taken into a police cruiser while officers entered her home. Inside were the bodies of her stepfather, 31-year-old Brian Conrad, her brother, 14-year-old Zach Duan, and her 35-year-old mother, Mitchell, who was six months pregnant. Fifteen spent shell casings were recovered from inside the home. The back door was damaged from where the murderer had broken in, and a shoe prints and tire tracks were found at the scene. However, nothing of value seemed to have been taken. It seemed that the man had broken in and gone straight to the master bedroom where he shot Brian Conrad three times, then Molly the pet dog twice, and then pregnant Mitchell five times. The heartless killer would later be identified as 23-year-old Levi King, and unknown to Texas police, he was on his way to Mexico. What makes this already unthinkable crime even more shocking is that these murders were the last in a killing spree that had started 15 hours earlier in Pineville in rural Missouri. Before killing nearly the whole Conrad family, King broke into the home of seven-year-old Orly McCool and shot him and his 47-year-old daughter-in-law, Laura Don McCool, dead. He then continued to Texas, where he stopped at the Conrad's isolated farmhouse on the outskirts of Pampa. The first two victims were found by members of their family who called at their house just a few hours after Robin had alerted Texas police to her family's annihilation. The multi-murderer crossed the border from El Paso, Texas, into Mexico, but for some reason he decided to return to the U.S. soon after. When he reached the border at around 9 p.m. on September 30th, he handed multiple IDs to the patrol agent. One of them belonged to Robin's stepfather. He admitted to having weapons and was asked to step out of the vehicle. In the car, he had the AK-47, a 9mm Smith & Wesson, a 380, and a scoped rifle. By this time, 
Missouri police had identified King as the shooter in the McCool double homicide, and an arrest warrant had been issued for him. When Border Patrol identified him as the wanted man, they called the El Paso PD. The suspect confessed to shooting the McCools, explaining to police that he had gotten angry because his father had kicked him out of his house, so he had reportedly taken some guns and gone out to shoot people. But the self-confessed murderer kept quiet about the murders in Texas and transferred to Missouri, and authorities in Pampa were at a loss with no suspects or motive. In October, authorities heard that King had told a fellow prisoner that he was responsible for four murders that he had been caught for in Texas. Of course, he had no idea Robin had survived. As soon as Texas Sheriff learned of the inmate's confession and that he had been found with Brian Conrad's ID and an AK-47 at the border, he became their prime suspect. King had grown up in a home littered with weapons and had a criminal past. He had been charged with arson and burglary, but served less than three years of his 14-year sentence and was released to a halfway house. In March 2006, King was charged with two counts of murder in Missouri and three counts of murder in Texas. Both states have the death penalty, but it was removed as an option in Missouri when the suspect agreed to plead guilty. In April 2008, Levi King was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole for murdering Orly and Don McCool in Missouri. Four months later, he first pleaded not guilty to the murders of the Conrad family in Texas, but changed his plea to guilty before going to trial. In Texas, the death penalty was still on the table. A then 14-year-old Robin bravely took the stand and read a victim impact statement. At one point, she faced the killer and told him that her mother's screams from that night still haunt her. The jury began deliberating on October 5th. One juror refused to vote for the death penalty, and so, without the required unanimous vote, Levi King was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Showing great courage, Robin returned to the stand and forgave her family's killer. She said she hoped he would ask God for forgiveness with this time. King was sent to the Eastern Reception Diagnostic and Correctional Center in Bonterre, Missouri, where he remains incarcerated. Robin went through months of therapy and lived a normal teenage life. There were three times shortly after the murders when people would stare, but it lessened with time. Robin keeps in touch with the officers who took care of her on the horrific night and became a lifesaver herself when she rescued a drowning child. In 2014, she told the Texas Monthly that she wanted to continue helping children by becoming a pediatric nurse. You don't get more Australian than this next call. 72-year-old Heather was mowing her lawn when she saw a dark-colored snake weave through the grass. Snakes are perhaps one of the most feared animals in the world. And Australia definitely has more than its fair share of deadly serpents. But no snake was going to send Heather running from her garden. Instead of fleeing as you might expect, Heather went after the snake. I spotted the town or suburb of the emergency. I need to ask the question first. Okay, well, I'm not just, yeah, I'm not going to send an ambulance just yet. Okay, tell me exactly what's happened. Well, I've been out mowing and I have disturbed the snakes in the, in the garden. Mm -hmm. I've got two spots on my leg and they're about an inch apart. Would that be a snake bite? Well, potentially. Um, I think that probably will err on the side of caution. Um, did you feel it happen? Um, no, I didn't even see the snake until it, 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 it uh, moves and, and I've run over it and then I look down and I can see that I've got two Um, things you put around your head when you're doing your makeup. 
<laughs> with hair. <laughs> with your head, like head down and things. Um, have you got any tea towels or towels or anything um, in, in your reach? So I'll go get some. Yep. Okay. Wrap the limb from the area of the bite down to your foot, then back up the, the body um, snugly enough to get one finger to slip between the bandage and the skin. So it's quite a lot of bandaging. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Um, like I said, you're keeping wonderfully calm. I love that. So I'm just hoping they don't laugh at me and say, no, I'm not going to laugh at you. You're taking the appropriate precautions, and that's the most important thing. And it must have been under one of those drains. I think you enjoyed them. Oh, gosh. I, <laughs> I didn't scream. I just got the um, murmur, and I just did it one big push right across it and chopped it off. I'm one good snake, but I'm not going to be smoking it. I'm going to be one Yeah, I hate them. <laughs> Anyway, they're in there. All right, okay. Heather, I'm going to leave you with the paramedics, okay? Don't feel silly. All the very best. The retiree usually hired someone to mow her lawn, but that day she had asked him to tend to her friend's garden as the friend's husband had recently passed away. After Heather had killed the snake, it was identified as a venomous red-bellied black snake. Its venom contains a concoction of toxins which in extreme cases can cause necrosis that requires amputation, but there have been no recorded deaths from red-bellied black snakes. Luckily, no venom was injected when Heather was bitten, and she was released from the hospital after 24 hours of repeated blood tests and close observation. Catherine, the operator who took the call, was impressed with Heather's ability to stay so calm and called her a badass grandma. Still, one neighbor wasn't so impressed and accused her of upsetting the ecosystem. Heather didn't feel any symptoms from the bite, such as sickness, but she did say that she felt a bit stupid. Staying in Australia in 2020, at the height of the coronavirus outbreak, they had some of the world's strictest rules to keep the virus under control. Unable to travel freely, Many Australians were confined to their homes. During this strange time, seven-year-old Archer Barrows woke up in the middle of the night, went into his mom's room, and found her unresponsive and shaking. Archer, who was on the autism spectrum, unlocked his mom's phone and video called his grandma. When he saw Archer's mom was unconscious, she told him to hang up and call triple zero. Okay, Archer, you're with the uh, nice ambulance lady now. You can have a talk to her, okay? Hi, Archer. My name's Emma. What exactly what happened, mate? Oh, you I think I was sleeping and I woke up and I saw her sleeping, snoring loud and shaking. Shaking? Making her up, holding her hands up and down. Okay, do you know what's happened with mum? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. We're going to get you some help out there, mate, okay? Okay. Okay, and when you say shaking, is her whole body shaking or is it just her hands? Mm -hmm. Can you describe the shaking to me? Okay, and are you with her now? Yes, yeah, so it's a bit better now because she's not shaking as much as her eyes are closed. Okay, how old is your mum, Archer? My mum's 45 or 6. 45 or 6? Okay, you're doing a really good job there. I'm just going to ask you some questions so we can get her the best help, okay? Is she awake? No. Is she breathing? Yes. Okay, is her breathing completely normal? I think so. You think so? Does it sound like her breathing normally does? I see her belly going up and down. Okay, good boy. That's it. Is she still unconscious? Is she still not awake? Yes, yes, no Okay, we've got that help organised there for you, okay? So talking to me isn't slowing anything down. Do you or is it just you and Mum? It's just you me and Mum. Okay, I'm organising help for you now, mate. Stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. If there is a defibrillator available, send someone to get it now in case we need it later. What's that? That's okay. It's a heart starting machine, but most people don't have them in their home, so you probably don't have one. No. Okay, I'm organising help for you now. Stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Are you right with mum now? Yes. You're doing a really good job. Listen carefully. Lay her flat on her back and remove any pillows. How's she lying at the moment? 
She's on her back. Yeah. Okay. And are there any pillows under her, or is it is she lying on the ground? Lying on the bed. Lying on the bed. Are there any pillows under her head? No. Okay. Good. Now place your ha hand on her forehead and your other hand under her neck. Then tilt the head back. Oh, tilt the head back. So put one hand on the top of her head, on her forehead. Do you know what her forehead is? Yeah. Or her forehead? Then put your other hand under her neck. Okay. And then just gently tilt her head back a little bit. I don't know what that means. Um, so put, push her head backwards a little bit. Okay. It just, it just can help with her breathing. Okay, it can help to open up her airway. I think she's breathing really okay. I just don't know. Okay. C can you feel or hear any breathing now yes. that you've done that? Yes. Is she breathing normally? I think she's good now. She's not shaking anymore. Okay, that's good. Was her whole body shaking, Archer? No, her hair was just going up and down. Her hand was just going up and down? Yeah. Okay. Is she breathing normally? Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. This might be a bit tricky, but we'll give it a try. Can you try and turn your mum onto her side with her head tilted back? So keep her head how you had it before, so it's just leaning back a little bit. And then try and turn mum onto her side. Oh. Thank you. Can't do it. You can't do it? Yeah. That's okay, mate. That's all right. You've done a good job. We're just going to stay with her and check her breathing often, okay? I'm going to stay on the line until the help arrives. So you just let me know when the ambulance are there. Or let me know if anything changes with mum, okay? okay. You're doing a really good job there. You're being very brave. How's mum doing at the moment, Archer? She's still doing good. Still doing good? Okay. How's her breathing going now? Good. Good? Okay. Good. We might just do a test on her breathing, okay? Okay. So what I need you to do is I want you to say the word now every time you see mum take a breath in. Okay? Mum. Next, next one? Next one? Now. Next one? Now. Last one? Now. Okay, that's good. So mum's getting enough air in there, okay? Okay. You've done a really good job calling us. Well done. How's mum going now? Is there any changes at all? I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. Mm. How's her breathing? Is it any different or the same? Grandma, yeah. I called grandma first. You called grandma? Okay, good. Good mm -hmm. good job. You told me the grandma was the person that told me to call George. Oh, well, that was good of her. Archer's mom, 46-year-old Anastasia Barros, has diabetes and was suffering from hypoglycemia. Her blood sugar level had dropped dangerously low. Without treatment, blood glucose levels can continue to fall and cause loss of consciousness, seizures, and even death. Following her diabetes diagnosis, Anastasia knew the dangers and had prepped her son on what to do should anything happen to her. The Melbourne mom of one said it was a pure coincidence that she had spoken to him earlier that week about what to do in an emergency. The young Australian had thought he should dial 911 but his mom told him that dialing 000, the local emergency number, would be better. Despite being stressed and terrified, Archer did a fantastic job following the operator's instructions and performing life-saving checks until the ambulance arrived. Even when police and paramedics entered a Surrey Hills suburban home looking like characters from a sci-fi movie with their masks and goggles, the grade two student wasn't faced. Paramedics Emily and Matt rushed the 46-year-old to the hospital while Archer was invited into the front seat of a police car. 
When handed the car's radio, there was a special message from the police dispatchers who told the little boy how proud they were of him. In return, the seven-year-old taught Victorian police officers how to do the floss dance, and before he knew it, he was back with his mom, who made a full recovery. In 2021, Archer was awarded a Junior Triple Zero Hero Award for making the call that saved his mom's life. Unfortunately, the ceremony was canceled due to COVID-19, so Archer's certificate and medal were mailed to him. The Triple Zero Hero Awards highlight the importance of teaching young children when and how to call emergency services, but Archer already knows this. He told Kids News, it's important to know how to call triple zero because other kids can help their mothers. At around 9 p.m. on Saturday, September 23, 2017, EMS call operators in Florida began to receive calls about roadkill, maybe a deer, on the I-10 highway between mile markers 181 and 182. The first call was made by a Spanish-speaking man who called at 8.58 p.m. 911. One car from me is like a little, for a little bit more and go to crash. The 182, eastbound. It, it, yeah, it's born and okay. one market, 182, between 181. Between 181 and 182, yeah, I see eastbound. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to transfer you to FHP, but I'm going to also send an officer, okay? Hold on. This was closely followed by another call from the same location at 9.03 p.m. The information this caller gives casts a much darker light on what you just heard. 911? Um, yes, I need a paramedic. The 181 on the interstate. Exit 181. Okay, hold on one second. 181 eastbound or westbound? Um, westbound. What's going on? Uh, my fiance say we got into an altercation. She just jumped out of the car and I think she got hit. She got hit and it is... Oh, my God. Okay, okay, you you say that someone got hit? Yes, I think she's deceased. She's, she's in the middle of the road right now. She's she's in the of, is she laying down in the middle of the road? Yes, ma'am. They, they, I think she just ran over. Now she just jumped out of the car. We got an altercation. She just jumped out of the car. Second, don't stay on the line with me, okay? What's your name, sir? Yes, I think she just jumped out of the car. Travis. Travis what? Collins. Collins. You sure it's westbound? Where you were heading to? We was headed to, um, we was headed toward Midway Way. And I you turned around. Midway, so. That would be eastbound. That would be eastbound. Okay, yeah, well, I'm on, I, I, I see, I see an officer now. You see an officer now? Yes. What do you mean you believe your girlfriend was run over? I, I just, she jumped out the car. I, I, she jumped out the car with we was fuss, and I asked to see her telephone, and she jumped out the fucking car. And, and, and as simple as that, I promise to God, we, we was on bad turn, I asked to see her phone. She gave it to me and jumped out the car. What's your name? My name is Travis, Travis Collins. What kind of vehicle do you have? Yeah, ten, two, it's an LT with her car. Two, do you see a trooper pulling up? Okay. The man who made this call was 33-year-old Travis Collins, and the woman he claimed jumped out of the car as it sped down the I-10 at 70 miles an hour was 36-year-old Shamiria Thomas. At 9.13 p.m., a third call from the highway came in. Hello, um, I am driving down I-10, um, and I hit what appeared to be already roadkill on the road. Um, my car immediately decided to smell of gasoline. Um, so I pulled over on the side of the road. Who are you, ma'am? I am on I-10 eastbound, um, about 20 miles away, 15 miles away from exit 199. So around mile marker um, 184. Okay, hold on a second. Let me transfer to FHP, okay? Okay. So I read the trail duty. I'm staring at me, okay? Hi, um, I am on eastbound I-10, 
about mile marker 184. Um, I hit when it appears to be roadkill in the middle of the road, like a deer or something, and immediately started smelling gasoline, a strong gasoline smell, so I pulled over to the side of the road. Are you, you said you're eastbound? Yes, I can eastbound. A list of description of your vehicle? Uh, uh, a white Dodge Caravan minivan, and we're two cars, and then there's also a gray Dodge minivan on the side of the road. Oh, so two, both of y'all hit the same thing? Um, we don't think there's damage to the second vehicle, but it's a, a group of students that we are driving, so we both pulled over. What's your name and a callback number? Mm-hmm. Alexandra McGarvey, and my callback number is... Okay, and, all uh, right, one moment. And is your vehicle drivable? I think so. Um, it's a rental, and Enterprise said they would not send anyone out to look at the vehicle until it was cleared by the fire department because of the gasoline odor. Okay. Okay, you said the gray Dodge minivan doesn't have any um, damages to its vehicle? We don't believe so. All right, well, y'all just hang tight there on Mount Marker 184, and as soon as we have a troop available, we'll get them up there to you, okay? By now, the puzzle pieces were coming together. There was no deer. Unbeknown to them at the time, the drivers on the I-10 that September night had struck and run over a woman. The last call came in from a highway patrol officer. Where's Jasmine 911? Hey, this is Gloria Brown, Howard Patrol. Can you give me the Spanish-speaking male's um, phone number that he called from? Oh, oh I'll we'll have to look for it. Uh, 857 should be, because we received it at 858 and 42. Okay, and I'm going to have to, because I've actually got, I'll have one of the latest call you back, okay? Okay, all right, if you have any more phone numbers of anybody that says that they struck that, just um, call me back with the name and the phone number, okay? That's what well, we, you know, we've got people that have trouble with their car after they struck it at the 184, right? Yeah, yeah. We've we got Midway out with them. Okay. Yeah, and make sure Midway doesn't call a record for her or anything. Okay. 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 Our trooper should be um, headed out there. Uh, yeah, they're still en route, but they are coming to her. Okay? Okay. All, all right. right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. When law enforcement got to the scene, they found Shamiria Thomas deceased on the highway. Oddly, there was also no sign of the car that the victim had been in. Then, the county sheriff's officer spotted a vehicle on the opposite side of the highway. When they approached it, a man got out and asked them what had happened. The man identified himself as Travis Collins, the second 911 caller who said that Shamiria was his fiance. A name check for Collins brought up an outstanding warrant from July for aggravated battery, which had been against Shamiria. Having already told the 911 dispatcher one story and then police on the scene another, Collins was taken to be interrogated. Police had no witnesses who had seen Shamaria exit the vehicle and needed to find out what had happened. Collins didn't sound upset at all due to his girlfriend's death. The suspect told the homicide detective that he and Shamaria had been fighting in the car, but the fight died down. He said he beat his girlfriend and pressed her face against the window. Shamaria, who was driving, was forced to pull over and stop. Collins said he hit Shamaria two good times. He said he then repeatedly punched her in the face for two minutes. They cooled down and got back in the car and went on their way. Collins claimed he grabbed her phone from her as he was sure there was something on it that she didn't want him to see. She allegedly snatched it back and then suddenly jumped out of the vehicle. Collins told the detective she opened the door and she was out of there. When asked why she would have done that, the violent man told the detective that it was probably because she was afraid of what he might do to her. Shamaria had been driving, and according to Collins, he got control of the car and managed to get into the driver's seat. The suspect claimed he felt like it was his fault because they were fighting, but he said he wasn't to blame. Collins was free to go after his interview, but he was arrested on the domestic battery charge a few days later. Shamaria's family knew she would never jump from a speeding car on her own accord. She was a mother of four daughters and a beloved member of her family. Investigators reassured Shamaria's family that they were working on the case and would solve it. Shamaria's funeral was held a week after her senseless death. She was buried in Sunnyvale Cemetery in Quincy. After two years, Collins was arrested for kidnapping and the first degree murder of Shamaria Thomas. Sergeant Angela Hightower from the Gadsden County Sheriff's Office said, with Shamaria not being here to speak for herself or be a voice for herself, we relied solely on the evidence and the witness and the facts to be a voice for her. 
Gadsden County Sheriff's Office's SWAT team took him from his home at around 9 p.m. on January 25, 2019. According to the probable cause affidavit, Collins had confessed. For Shamiria's mother, Frida Houston, his arrest brought her relief. That was just so much joy for my family, she said. Everyone was just so elated. Shamiria was Frida's only child and was described as a blessing to be around, always joyful and beautiful inside and out. Travis Collins is currently being held in the Gadsden County Jail on no bond until his trial. When baby Dean was born in Melbourne, Australia, he had a number of serious allergies. On Christmas Day 2010, his parents learned the importance of always carrying an EpiPen. So what's the problem? Tell me exactly what happened. Okay, male or female? Male. And uh, you think allergic reaction? Yeah. Okay. And you're with him right now? Yes. And how old is he? 18 months? 18 months. Okay. Now, is that him I can hear in the background? Pardon? Is that him I can yes. hear in the background? Yes. Okay. And He's uh, airing through his lungs and it's very deep. Okay. Does he have difficulty breathing or swallowing? Like he's having difficulty breathing. Okay. Is he completely awake? Yes. yes but and when did this, hard to breathe. When did this start? About 15 minutes ago. Okay. And is the condition getting worse now? Yes, it is. Do you have any special medications or injections? EpiPen. You have an EpiPen? Have I you used it? it okay. And uh, just bear with me. Where is it at the moment? At home. I'm at my mum's house. Okay. So, look, we've organised the ambulance for him. Yes. Okay. What is it that he's allergic to? He's allergic to eggs, wheat, nuts, nut, uh, dairy, quite a lot of things. I've just given him some dirt tape, but it doesn't look like he's healthy. And he's sucking a lot of air in through his lungs. Okay. So, look, you've got him sitting up at the moment? Yeah, but he's really sort of flopping. Okay. We need him sitting up at the moment, and if you can try and keep his chin away from his chest, because it will help to keep his airway open, okay? okay. Now, um, you said, I'm going to stay on the phone with you until the ambulance gets there. His eyes a little bit. I don't know why. No, that's okay. Listen, while he's breathing, okay, and he's still conscious, it's a very, very good sign. What sort of reaction does he usually have to this sort of thing? This looks a bit worse because his air's sort of sucking in. Oh, is coming? How far away is the ambulance? They're coming lights and sirens as quickly as they can, ma'am, okay? So we're not holding them up at all, okay? I just need to get the best information possible so they're aware of what's going on when they get there, okay? okay? So and the last time that he had a reaction like this, you're saying this is worse. What are the symptoms like? Like, how are they worse? The time is more airways of finding it, like, he looks more like he's sucking in air. Yeah. Okay. And that's him obviously crying, right? Yeah. Okay. Has he got any has he got any swelling around his face? Hard to tell. <laughs> swelling on his face. Hard to tell. No, that's okay. So he's got a red face, but it's more his uh neck area is sucking in air. Okay, so he's sucking in air, is that through his nose? No. Well not through his through his neck. You know the little... Okay, so he's so he's sort of straining every time he does. He's wheezing noises, yep. He's really closing his eyes now. Okay, listen, I need you to try and, uh, like, keep him woken. Yeah. Like, try and, you know, if he does go to close his eyes and he doesn't open them, just talk to him, try and wake him up again. Keep his head up. Yep. Okay, so try and keep him try and keep him sitting up, okay, or standing up, or if he's in your arms or something, try and keep, like I said, a bit upright and his chin away from his chest. It will help to keep his airway open. Okay, the panic is. The EMS operator expertly got the information she needed and continued to provide life-saving advice while paramedics sped to the scene. The eight-month-old had had allergic reactions before, but allergies can be unpredictable. This time, his allergic reaction was life-threatening and led to anaphylaxis shock. His airways had tightened so much, breathing was almost impossible. On the way to the hospital, the baby's heart rate dropped and he lost consciousness. Dean was administered epinephrine, which saved his life. Thankfully, a tragedy was avoided and the family was able to spend Christmas together. Dean's parents are forever grateful to the medics who saved her son's life. After her family's frightening experience, Katie started campaigning to raise awareness of the seriousness of allergies. She posted the call she made to YouTube to educate other people and parents about the dangers of food allergies and the importance of always having an EpiPen with you, no matter where you are going or how quick you'll be.
Allergies are often the butt of the joke, but in reality, they are no laughing matter. Even if a previous allergic reaction was mild, the next one could be deadly. Dean and his family are now experts on allergies and are looking forward to an allergy-free tomorrow. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting, and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.